Good Monday night to you. I am Tabum Zule, and thank you for joining us tonight here on In Focus. We begin with the latest recorded numbers of COVID-19 infections in the country. Now uh, with 5,600 new cases uh, reported in the latest 24-hour cycle. The majority of these cases were recorded in Guazulu Natal, which accounts for 35% of the tally, followed by the Western Cape at 16%. And in the same cycle, a further 235 people have lost their lives to COVID-19. This is a slight increase from the previous recorded cycle when 134 deaths were registered. Now, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases says it's closely monitoring the trend of a new coronavirus variant which was detected in South Africa back in May. Scientists say they are confident that the variant does not pose a significant risk, alleviating fears that it may worsen the devastation of the third wave. Professor Penny Moore says there's no reason to panic. Is that based on our experience with, with variants across the world um, and based on our considerable experience now, um, testing the various vaccines that are present um, in South Africa and are being rolled out in South Africa, is that it seems that, that many of these variants that, um, that emerge and will continue to emerge, and that's something we can discuss, do seem to uh, show reduced efficacy when it, it reduced sensitivity to the antibodies that vaccines trigger. But the most important thing, I think, to emphasize again and again is that um, despite the emergence of variants, such as beta, um, which dominated the second wave, and delta, which continues to dominate this wave, all of the vaccines happily managed to maintain their efficacy against severe disease um, and against death. A leading scientists who are keeping close tabs on the C.1.2 lineage say they now, uh, they, rather the new variant has been detected across seven provinces in South Africa. The NICD principal medical scientist Dr. Janelle Berman says uh, the institute generated 16,000 SARS-2 genomics from uh, specimens in the country. She has, however, warned that the Delta variant continues to dominate in South Africa uh, with the C.1.2 detected in low frequency in some parts of the country. We've generated over 16,000 um, SARS-CoV-2 genomes um, from specimens in South Africa. Um, as you probably all are aware, the Delta variant has been dominating our third wave and does continue to dominate. So this graph is showing um, on the vertical axis percentage. Um, and then apologies, my axes are dropped off, but on the uh, horizontal axis is um, weeks um, uh, in 2021. Um, so you can see here, we, we, we started picking up um, the Delta variant and then this tracks quite nicely with our third wave where we see very large number of um, sequences belonging to this variant. Then in purple over here is actually the C12 lineage, um, which we first started detecting around um, the beginning of May. Um, and it has been increasing in frequency, but it remains at relatively low frequency. Um, if you look at the graph here on this side, you can see the frequency has been increasing per month, um, but still only less than 3% of our sequences belong to this lineage. Right over 12 million vaccines have been administered in South Africa with just under 28,000 administered yesterday. This as the country continues to fight the impact of COVID-19. But how are these numbers translating provincially? Here to help us uh, to get a closer look at these numbers, I'm joined by the Western Cape Health MEC, Dr. Nama French Mbombo, and Limpopo Health MEC, Dr. Popi Ramatova. We were due to have uh, uh, Sombata, Madota Sombata from the Northwest. However, he's stuck in a plane at this point in time and couldn't make uh, this conversation. Well, let's take your views and your comments tonight. 072 110 You can tweet us at Newsroom 405. MECs, good evening. Good to have you with us tonight on In Focus. Good evening. Um, evening. And says, let's look at the, the numbers uh, that we are talking about today. I mean, 12 million vaccines having been administered uh, in the country world, uh, well, uh, nationally, you would look at that and say it's probably about a 18 uh, or so percentage uh, uh, of the population that has been inoculated. 
pretty much, I suppose, on par with the percentage if you look at the Western Cape and the number of doses that you have administered, uh, with uh, Limpopo slightly below it at about 15 to 16 percent, depending on what the latest numbers are. Are you confident about um, the national coverage that we need to uh, hit the target of 70 percent uh, by the end of the year, looking at the numbers that you have uh, inoculated in your provinces so far since the start of the uh, uh, inoculation campaign. Let's start with you, uh, Dr. Ramatou. Um, if, evening and evening to your viewers out there. We, we just want to indicate that um, where we are sitting as in Popo, we, we are not um, excited or satisfied um, at the rate at which our people are coming to be vaccinated. Um, you see it changes a week, some weeks. You see more people coming. Some weeks people are not coming. And also the, what we raised earlier on, the sustainability in terms of vaccine supply will determine uh, the time frame in terms of us reaching uh, the 70%. I'm saying this because, for instance, uh, in the past two weeks, we were doing well because uh, young people, I don't know for what reason or because of the single jab, they all preferred to be inoculated with J&J. &J. But uh, since uh, the, the end of last week and even this week, beginning of this week, due to the shortage of J&J, uh, they, uh, there is a lot of hesitance. We saw so many of young people today retaining uh, from the stations uh, when they are offered the, the, the Pfizer. So, so these are the, some of the issues that uh, regress us because we need to go back and, and try to educate them that uh, this is the, the, the vaccine's efficacy are the same. They are both registered in the country. Pfizer that you are not rejecting, you, that you are currently even rejecting, has even been registered by FDA. So those are some of the issues that are making it difficult for us to achieve the, the, the results that we want to. Secondly, you have rightfully indicated the vaccine hesitancy that we continue to see amongst our people as a result of a fake uh, social media uh, uh, information that are all, all over. When we were dealing with the city, uh, senior citizens, the 60 years and above, that is why we've already passed the 70% of those elderly people. Uh, we've already vaccinated them because many of them are not on social media, so they don't read these fake news. But when you are dealing with the current uh, age group, they are all on social media. They read all these scary stories that are fake. And once you see us responding, by coming up with other initiatives to try to occupy that social media space to get uh, young people start to have attention, yeah. their attention, so that we can uh, engage on these uh, vaccines and also give us an opportunity to be able to educate them on the vaccine safety. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, we can reassure you that we are still committed uh, we will deal with these two major challenges to make sure that uh, by the end of this year we would have been able to reach uh, the, the desired 70% uh, of mm. adults uh, having received, at least even if it means it's a one dose. Now, MEC, you are talking about those with high decision-making uh, commitment. I want to talk to you uh, in a moment about those with low decision-making uh, involvement uh, when it comes to the taking of the vaccines. But uh, let's bring in uh, uh, Dr. Mbombo. Dr. Mbombo, good to have you with us. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the uh, Minister of Health looking at the progression of the virus, saying it's particularly unpredictable, and there's great concern in the Western Cape that although infections are dropping everywhere else, Western Cape, I think the Eastern Cape and the Northern Cape, um, uh, we are still continuing to see a rise in numbers there. Um, yes, indeed, uh, there is that concern, uh, but uh, in terms of the all, if you look at all the indicators, at least you see some decrease. 
uh, for example, uh, for the um, there are some decreasing uh, the productivity rate, uh, the hospitalization. You don't see as much. Let me see. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to come in here. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Apologies, but I think there is an audio or television device that is on in the room that is giving us a, 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 a delayed feed uh, coming through. So if you can have that uh, turned down, that will certainly help uh, for clarity uh, of what you are uh, saying uh, at the moment. We, we are getting that twice. Let's try again, NEC. So you're saying there are a number of indicators that are showing a downward trend. Yes, um, as, as I was saying that, if you look at the indicators, um, for example, the hospitalization, the reproductive rate, uh, the positivity rate, uh, the utilization of the oxygen, and also the number of the healthcare workers infected. It does show that um, there is some decrease. But noting there will always be a delay of from the infection up to the hospitalization. So once we still have got about 3,400 of the uh, hospital in terms of the uh, uh, hospital occupancy, and also which makes about 28%, of the hospital occupancy of the COVID people, excluding those who are under investigation. But there is a sign. However, having said that, lessons learned from the second wave, it shows that sometimes you get a plateau and then it uh, there's a decline and then you see that there's a, some sharp increase. And, 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 and when do so you expect to reach the peak of the third wave? Uh, there are about 7% chances that we might have reached the peak. But what we know is that uh, after mostly weekends, especially we'll be now approaching the, um, the long weekend, September, we don't know what could happen afterwards. And also there will be quite a high level of movement because of the school closures. Yeah. So, but at least when the reproductive rate does, it does show that at least it's not above one. It does give um, hope in that aspect and also now that we have got more people who are being vaccinated, because we are almost about 2 million, probably by the end of the day, we might be about 2 million, uh, when we have got a high number of people who are vaccinated. However, the issue of the equitable access to the vaccines, because you might be excited that there might be many un, uh, over 18 year olds under 35 that are vaccinated, but with the vulnerable uh, who are not vaccinated, who are the uninsured, who are not vaccinated, these are the ones who end up clogging the system. So it shouldn't be only about chasing the numbers. It's about getting to where those people who are likely to right. be uh, coming to our hospital, that are the ones that we need to reach further, like the homeless, yeah. the factory workers, the farm workers, and the young people that are there in the periphery. So we shouldn't only be focusing on the numbers, but where are these numbers are yes. before we get excited. Indeed, we're going to talk about that. How do you counter the vaccine apathy but also vaccine hesitancy and we talk apathy are people who don't have actually vaccines in their psyche at the moment they're not even thinking about them maybe some of them don't even think they're at risk uh, and they just don't feel like they need to be taking vaccines how does the healthcare system reach those people and get them to be vaccinated we'll come back in a moment with western cape health mec dr noma french and bombo and Bimpopo health mec dr poppy ramatu and live tonight on in focus the conversation on the vaccine coverage in the western cape as well as in Limpopo, the MECs are for health, Dr. Noma French Mbombo and Dr. Popi Ramatu. But before the break, MEC, you mentioned the uninsured that are clogging up the system. Um, uh, there should relatively be no difference between the insured and the uninsured in terms of access to vaccine. What is causing the discrepancy? Um, from the beginning, uh, when the third wave started, you find that it was mostly... Uh, the in short, which is mostly from the private, where you had quite a large number of the hospitalization and the cases. Understandable because uh, the Delta variant was coming from overseas. And then it changed now to having more of the uninsured because as there's a higher level of community transmission. Now, if you look at the system of the how one access the vaccination, it starts with the EVDS, which is it favored more people who have got the devices and also who could be able, because at the time you have to, op you have to uh, open the each case by case, I mean, site by site, you wouldn't be able to open all the sites, especially when the supply was minimal. And therefore, it ended up having more of those who are in short stroke private 
to have an, more access to the vaccination because of that. And therefore, for us, we have to change the situation where we create a demand yeah. among the uninsured. For example, Kylie Chow took later uh, to be able to do more of the uh, vaccinating, although it's still still uh, behind. But the issue is about at the time you have to reach the anti uh, in the farms and also where they are not be able yeah. to reachable, including the homeless. How, how did you do that, that MEC? How did you do that? How did you counter that particular challenge? Um, it's about taking vaccines to the people. But there's no use to say to them that they we have just an open a hall, you must just go there. Even when we open for the weekend initially, we find that the utilization was in March. So when we ended up having the pop-up sites, like you go, you work, work, uh, work together with the SASA, you bring a pop-up bus at the mall at the time that the Omas and the Opas are shopping. It made things easier. Yeah. Pop-up buses in the farms, because you'll understand that mostly they are seasonal farm workers, where you might not get them, and uh, maybe next week they'll be at the other farm. But we brought the buses next to them, uh, to the farm workers. It made it easier. Now, with the, um, the under 35s that it has opened, we do know that even before COVID, with the young people, they don't go to the health services. We have to take the health services to them. When, when we brought the music trucks, uh, having some jive or jog, if we put it like that, it has created such a demand. Like today, we opened the site at the UCT, which will make it now uh, for the young people, not only for those at the university, but those who are around that shopping area yeah. Uh, in the CBD to be able to access. Yeah. Contrast that with Dr. Ramatuba's uh, poster of uh, um, Jolo slaps better without uh, <laughs> or with vaccine. I'm not quite sure how the phrasing goes. And that created quite a, an uproar. Well, on the other hand, the Western Cape say, well, bring the Jolo and the young people come. It makes it more convenient and then they get vaccinated. Uh, uh, MEC, talk about uh, how your particular approach uh, has uh, impacted the, 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 the attraction of that cohort, uh, 18 to 35. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I, I think you are missing the jaw yeah. poster. No, I, I, I'm saying MEC, uh, no, my French Mbombo was saying they bring the jaw and when they bring the jaw, it makes it convenient for the young people to be there and get vaccinated. You're saying Mjolo slaps better with the vaccine. How, how do the two meet and, and, and how, how, how is the response uh, from both? I think we, we as, as MEC, Mama French has, has indicated, it's uh, young people will never come to our facilities unless they are seriously sick because they think the hospitals are associated or clinics with death and horror stories. So, so when you're taking the vaccine to them, but also you must bring it, uh, bring life. And, and I think that those are the strategies that, that work. When you have your Makazi performing and one of the performance, there's a song that is uh, geology at Ghana, meaning that Mujolo collapses. And for us, it, it's even the, the, the young people, they get excited that if you don't get vaccinated, it will also collapse. So, so among the young people themselves, because we even explain to them the scientific meaning of, of that message uh, to say, if I'm vaccinated and my partner is not vaccinated, we must remember that my partner remains the factory hub of these viruses to mutate and get more variants, which some of them, we don't know how more transmissible they can be or how more available they could be. And we don't even know which var variant will drive the fourth wave. So, so when you, you put such poster and you explain to them what it means to say, you should not be satisfied by the fact that you are vaccinated and your partner is not vaccinated. Get both of you being vaccinated and it becomes cool to the young people. But of course, to the elderly people, it, it might sound like yeah, we have gone too far, but we, we can reassure you, the, the young people see it as, as cool and they continue to, to share the message and they continue to talk to to each other. When we go to TUT, for instance, they become that excitement 
and they all come and get uh, vaccinated. So, so the strategies, uh, like, like we said earlier on, will differ uh, when you're dealing with the elderly people. You will use a different strategy, uh, uh, as you were saying earlier on. How do we counter those who are not able to have ac access to, to, the, to the vaccine? Maybe uh, our advantage, which has been a dis disadvantage throughout, was that being a rural province, which 91% of its population is not insured, and then you only have got less 9% that is insured. And I'm talking about figures that were there before COVID-19 hit us, meaning after many people have lost their jobs now, the number would be far much more than 91%. Yeah. From the beginning, we knew that for our people to access this uh, uh, vaccine, which uh, it, the, the way it's designed to say you must uh, be registered on the EVDS, you already excluding someone who stays at Kundamalema where there's no cell phone network connectivity, the elderly person can't even uh, some read and write, yet you want them to understand internet and go and register for themselves. So that's why even from the beginning, our strategy has to mitigate for those and make sure that we go and register for them in their own household right. using the community is, network. Is, is, is it sustainable is, uh, though, MEC? You seem to have taken that outreach strategy where it's community-based and you're taking uh, the vaccines to the people themselves. It was convenient. It certainly seemed to have shown uh, the province of Limpopo uh, at the time being quite ahead of the other provinces. They've since then caught up. Have you abandoned that strategy or are you still sticking to it? We, we are not abandoning that strategy, but we are saying as part of mopping up, because we, we, we would, our, our wish is to make sure that if we were to reach the 70% um, vaccine coverage of adults by getting 100 or 99% of the 60 years and above and get 80% of the 50 and above as you temper, even if we are to get 50% of the 18 years and above, for us we'll be much more satisfied because you would have covered all those that are vulnerable who, when you are hit by the fourth wave, tend to be the ones, as the MEC has indicated, clock your system. They're the ones who are in your ICU, and that, that, those are the ones who succumb to the complications of COVID-19. So we will not abandon that uh, uh, strategy. It, it just that's because the resources also uh, are currently competing. We're competing resources. The way we will be doing the mop-up strategy of door-to-door -to, -door to continue to mop up the senior citizen, we must bear in mind that we need to reach out to other uh, age groups. For instance, the for 35 to 49 or to 59, we could find these are uh, people who are within the, the, the working environment. And that's why you, you saw us starting to, to work with the mines now. So we must take the very same resources that are doing door to door with the community to go and help us vaccinate in our mining, in our farming area, in our retail shops, in our malls, all those, because this is where we will find this category. Yeah. Now we are busy with the 18 to 34. You will find them in your Tibet colleges, in your universities, all over. So we stretch the resources and try to make sure that at the same time, we are vaccinating everyone who is from 18 years and above. Uh, we don't abandon the, the, the strategy that we started, but it will not be in the full force like when we really started. And we still believe that as time goes on, when we, we are satisfied that we've completely mopped up those who are above 60, it will give us a brief to now focus uh, fully on the 18 and, and the above. Let me see, when we come back, I want you to reflect on uh, this strategy of redirecting your resources to the vaccination drive. I heard you earlier on uh, lamenting the fact that 3 billion rands has already been cut off your budget. And does that mean we compromise uh, the upgrading of infrastructure and ensuring that we hire nurses and so on and so forth and how that is going to affect the overall 
health system. We continue next in a moment with the MECs for health in Limpopo as well as the Western Cape. And taking your views tonight, 072-110-584. Welcome back live with us tonight on In Focus on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405, MECs for health in Limpopo as well as the Western Cape. Apologies uh, for the MEC for the Northwest who could not make it with us because uh, of being caught in the flight. But the conversation continues as we ask the question, are we not missing the mark in communicating to a heterogeneous population to get them to take a single product here to use the same kind of messaging. MEC Mbombo, are we not missing the mark? Are we not going about this the wrong way? Uh, earlier on, you were talking uh, in one report about um, vaccine apathy and vaccine fatigue, which are two different things, and apathy and hesitancy also not being the same thing. Yet we want to get all those groupings uh, to follow a particular message. And so far, a message from government has been that of dealing with uh, the alleviation of vaccine anxiety. But you are not talking to the cohort whose uh, thinking is not even about vaccine. They don't think they're at risk, actually. Uh, they, they maybe have other concerns, but vaccine is not one of them. Are we using the right messaging, the right sources, and the right channels? One size doesn't fit all. For example, uh, we've got four uh, in the Western Cape where we've got young people. Uh, luckily, as I indicated, that we opened the UCC and the UWC and the others already open. Uh, now that it is spring and we're going to summer, it means that there will be more of the, uh, the young people going out, clapping. So that's why I indicated in okay. the jet. Uh, apologies, MEC. Apologies, MEC. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramatuba, maybe your, it's, it is on your line if you can mute because it sounded better. Uh, the last time uh, you had that on yeah. mute. We'll ask you to mute again uh, a bit later on. Uh, MEC Mbombo, you can go ahead. Yes. So uh, with the young people, that's why, as I indicated earlier, that uh, we've got four universities, and we do know that when it comes to the Cape Town, especially now spring is, uh, is going to be here, and also that summer there's a lot of the gatherings through clubbing. And if you think that you will have to keep on loud hailing, asking the youth to come to a thing, they won't come. So that's why the jabs before Joel uh, as a campaign is to take these vaccines to them. This Wednesday, uh, I'll be in one of the clubs where it will be about bringing the vaccines to them whilst there's a music dancing and also they are jabbing. Similar, sometimes it's a youth in church. So whilst they are having this, they are holy chaos. They have to jab as well. So you have to keep on bringing as many of the approaches, innovative ways to cater different uh, not only age groups, but also where they are coming from. We have got partnership with the uh, taxi industry, thanks to the Western Cape Public Transport, where we are using these taxi, we call them Red Dot, uh, the taxi industry, through the taxi associations, where they have to bring some of these older persons, which is the, the, the age group of the about 50, who will not uh, um, take a taxi to go to a health facility, even if it has been a walking distance. But for them, it's about you, I wait to, I won't. But when they see that now there is a taxi outside in the outside the street, they all jump in and go there and go and vaccinate. At the factory workers, especially in the industries, uh, 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 you'll find that some of them, they don't have that luxury to have an occupational health clinic for them. Like today, I went to one of those in, in Saldana, where you'll find that actually they bring the vaccines for their health work, I mean, for their factory workers. But for us, it's about how can we create the demand? I think the issue is about how do you create a demand? And also you tailor made by each age group and also according to the, um, to the geographical setting. Because in the metro CBD, it's completely different. You can jab them whilst they're in the long street uh, waiting for, uh, for go getting inside to the restaurant. Whereas if you go to the rural farming community, it's about where you bring the pastors because well, some of these young people might also be attending church as the influencers. For example, Limpombo spoke about the chiefs and the, and the head, head men or head yes. women yes. where they used. But for us, we might not have those, but you might have some influencers like the rabbi, uh, the imams, uh, the Christian pastors who, the, who have been actually able to assist us. In others, we have to use the community leaders, influential people, community leaders, like in Kailicha Wednesday, when we are having the spring as prank, 
uh, uh, just before Joel, it's about uh, with the uh, leaders there in the, uh, in the hospitality industry, where they are invited these young people, which they normally come anyway when there's no restrictions. So you cannot work it all by yourself as a government, as a health department. You have to work with other people because at the end, uh, COVID doesn't only affect health, but it affects everyone. But going towards the fourth wave, for us, what is crucial is about, at least as we indicated earlier, that 70% should be vaccinated, but we mustn't leave anyone behind, especially those who ended up using the public health services. Talking about public health services, then, uh, uh, Dr. Ramatuba, you can unmute now. Uh, the question of the budget cuts and uh, how you're redirecting uh, your budgets, particularly towards the COVID-19 vaccination uh, program, is that not going to compromise the other health services? Uh, of course, this is not just the, the challenge that uh, affected the, the provincial health department only. And I, I want to believe that uh, National Treasury has indicated, uh, I think, last year that uh, all of us, because of the challenges that the country is facing, we, we are all alive that we, we country is struggling economically. So when the budget cut were made, help even if we, we tried uh, to advocate uh, that we should not be part of those but unfortunately we are also affected and um, the Limpopo Department of Health has got its own historically unique challenges which we were when COVID-19 hit us we were in the process of trying to address that for instance I think our expenditure on a, a, a compensation uh, of employees uh, is at 76 percent, 74 percent, when when uh, it was it was reduced, which leaving us with less than 36 percent to deal with all the other issues, infrastructure, medicine, uh, all the other day-to-day -day running of of the health department. Now, when the cut happened, also, and we are told to cut on the COE because the other problem, the work that we've been doing as a department. Uh, where we diagnose what is this 76 percent about we realize it's more about human resource that is not necessary the core business of the department meaning your nurses your cleaners your groundsmen your doctors your radiographs you'll find that the bulk is so many administrators and managers who the department would not necessarily need as much as it will need a nurse and a doctor and a cleaner so we were in, with trying to deal with that when we're hit by COVID, and on top of it now we're hit by the budget, budget cuts. So hence, we are saying, you might have seen from the beginning, we've been saying as the Department of Health in the Pope, we can only win fighting this COVID-19 on the street because we will never dream and think that we will have all the luxury of ICU beds with your ventilators and all your fancy uh, and, 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 and equipment that you would require, we will only be able to afford the basics because of the current uh, financial constraints that the department has been facing even prior to uh, COVID-19. So what happened, with, which made us survive up to so far, and I think the team has done extremely well given the resource constraints that we have been in. We, we have been working and be proactive and putting up a lot of planning and a lot of effort on preventative rather than uh, waiting for people to be yeah. sick because we've seen that you can't win COVID-19 in ICU. You will be dreaming to think about that, but you can win it on the street. And you see us now that uh, COVID, the third wave, has given us a breather. If you can see numbers at Limpopo are very low, even the, the positivity rate and admission rate it's very low. It has given us a breather. And, and hence, it, 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 we, we feel pain. Mm -hmm. And, and Amy Simbomo was saying the other day, our, our health workers are being betrayed by the community when they reject the, the, the vaccine. It, it's so true because the very same COVID-19 nurses who were working during the third wave, now that we have a breather and they don't have patients in the world, they have gone to the field to start supporting the teams that were vaccinating. This is sharing of, of resources. They have not gone on a break 
because COVID-19 has given them a breather. So now when you then reject the virus, the vaccine, it then tells us to say, really, you are betraying us because the fourth wave is going to hit us and it means we won't even have time to rest because we must go back and nurse you. Yeah. And, and, and we want to say this as the help that uh, we will appreciate it uh, this time around when journalists start to ask us about our preparedness on the fourth wave. Let's no longer talk about how many ventilators have you procured, how many ICU nurses do you have, do you have physicians, do you have oxygen? Don't ask us about those questions. We need to work together. You must ask us about how far are you to reach the 70%. Yeah. Maybe it will sink in our people to say, look, come forth wave. All of us are tired because we have got a primary prevention tool that is scientific, that is evidence-based. We have seen healthcare workers who have been vaccinated. They were not admitted during the third wave. They are not dying during the third wave. So if we all get vaccinated, the preparedness for the fourth wave must be how many of us are taking the jab. And lastly, I would appreciate it as journalists, instead of asking health department, are you ready for the fourth wave? We must go and ask the public, are you ready for the fourth wave? Let's ask the individuals yeah. in the public yeah. if they are ready for the fourth wave. Now, MEC, I mean, I said the approach of preventative, but it is cold comfort for someone who wants to know if I do get to hospital, will there be an oxygen tank there? I mean, you're literally saying uh, you, 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 you are going to take your resources and focus them on the streets more than uh, ensuring that there's enough oxygen in the ICU. No, no, you must, you must get me correct. We're saying to you, we've been nursing first, second, third wave because we did not have the vaccine. Now that we have a vaccine, we can avoid nursing uh, people because that is why now that we have a breather, uh, our hospitals are not full. We have taken away our resources to go and vaccinate. They have not gone to rest. Now, if the fourth wave is to hit us, it means they must go back to nurse you. We, we, you see, as the health department, Unfortunately, we do not have that latitude to say when you are sick of COVID, we will check and say, are you vaccinated or not? If you are vaccinated, we will admit you and treat you. If you are not vaccinated, it was your choice, go away. Actually, we will triage you based on the severity of illness. And those who are refusing to be vaccinated now, they are the ones who are going to clog the system. That's why I'm saying they are betraying us, they are being unfair to us. And you see us saying, those who are in the economic industry can be able to assist us by saying, if you are not vaccinated, probably you must not go and attend a soccer match in the stadium. If I own a pub uh, because I have got the right of, of, of admission is preserved, I can simply say yeah. to you, like I would do someone wearing all stars and jeans that you are not allowed in my yeah. pub. Even those that are not vaccinated, I have a right to can say to them, you are not vaccinated. I've vaccinated myself. I've vaccinated my mm -hmm. client. That you can do. You we we have no such laws, though, MEC, in the country. We have no such laws in the country. But the president also having said that no one will be forced to take the vaccine. There is a difference between mandatory yeah. vaccination and self-regulation. I'm saying mm -hmm. to you currently, if I own a pub, I can tell you if you are not wearing, if you are wearing your takis and jeans, I will say it's written in the pub on the. Yeah, door right, right, right. Of admission is admit. reserved. Yes, so I'm saying here, yeah, can we explore something like that? We're not saying it's mandatory. Let's explore it because you can never exploit in the health sector because there, when a person is sick, you don't ask what, why was he deliberately? Did this person went to drink? and drive and crash, then we won't attend to it. That you have no room. That's where you will be dealing with the rights of people. You must attend to the patients. You must address their condition without asking questions. But in pub, I can ask you to say, can you please go and vaccinate so that you protect my clients 
and myself and yourself. Sounds like you're calling for mandatory vaccination, MEC, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, Western Cape MEC, Dr. Noma French Mbombo and Limpopo Health uh, MEC, uh, Dr. Popi Ramatubo. What do you make of what the MEC uh, is saying? Saying self-regulation, particularly in places uh, of leisure, rights of admission reserved. If you're not vaccinated, uh, maybe you should not be allowed to get to uh, watch that soccer match. We'll take your views in a moment. 072 Welcome back live with us tonight here on In Focus on Newsroom Africa Channel 405. Joined by the Western Cape Health MEC, Dr. Noma French Mbombo, and uh, the MEC for Health in Limpopo, Dr. Popi Ramatuba. Taking your views on 072-110-5584. Tweet us tonight at Newsroom uh, 405. Western Cape Health MEC, Dr. Noma French Mbombo, you say uh, 53, I think, health care workers uh, in your province having lost their lives. I mean, would you share the same sentiment that those who are not uh, getting vaccinated is a betrayal of healthcare workers in the country and therefore self-regulation should be the option. Um, just for correction, the 53, it happened in a month of December only. The total healthcare workers, the last time I checked for us in the Western Cape, there were about 181. But what I was trying to highlight is that from the end of June, to the early week of August. At the time, we only lost about 21 healthcare workers. Compared to December during the second wave, where we lost the 53 in one month. The, the, what I was trying to portray was about how the vaccine has helped us at least to strengthen the health system. But he, what the MEC for Rimpopo was saying was that health system is tired. Healthcare workers are tired because they've been working since March. It cannot be now we've got people who don't want to take a responsibility uh, where they want to clog the health system. But in addition to that, you must understand that whilst we're focusing on the COVID, there are other illnesses that are not on holiday. If you look in terms of the, the bulk of the, uh, uh, the waiting list, especially in the Western Cape in regard to some of the invasive or even uh, elective surgeries, uh, the, the people who we were unable to have a, 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 a just an ordinary um, surgery related to the breast cancer, the children who have been the waiting list, the knee operations, which these lists actually are quite longer even prior COVID. So people, it's not about they are, are, are affecting the others by being by infecting the others when they don't want to vaccinate, but if they are actually killing the health system for the other health, uh, um, uh, uh, other health problems as well. Ideally, we want to have a health system where nothing closes when there's a pandemic. A pandemic. It should be able to stand on its own. We cannot be just having another pandemic, because there might be after COVID, there might be another one. Or after this variant, there might be a, a, a other ones. How do we keep on closing the health system? Because remember, when now those people, they ended up having the severe illnesses, or complications because they are delayed to come because we are busy with the COVID. We still have to absorb them. So we want a health system that has to stomach and also to be able to endure any other and the pandemic that's going through. Now we do have the solution. Once we understand that we're not talking about the herd immunity, but at least we could be able to reduce severe illness and hospitalization from the COVID, people must go and vaccinate to protect this health system and also to protect their loved ones who are still queuing, waiting for the other services uh, to be able to be provided as such. So therefore, that's why we say that the healthcare workers have always had our backs all the time. They've never, they stayed at, they never stayed at home. They've been there throughout. They lost their loved ones. They lost their colleagues. It's psychologically actually uh, texting for them, texting for them. But now we see people who say that uh, they are anti-vaxxers. But these are the same people who are taking uh, medication for their diabetes. People who are taking Panados. People who are taking alcohol. They don't even know what the ingredients are that are there. People who are using drugs. But they can't have a nerve to say no to the vaccines because we don't know who made them. What about with the others? So that's why we always say that if you don't know what is happening, come to the hospitals. We'll show you how does it feel when you, as a, a health um, a person, you have to decide which ventilator you have to give it to the other one yeah. and not to the moral injury that affects 
our healthcare workers. Yeah. People must go and show, see. Surely, Bill, MEC, that can't be the way of alleviating vaccine anxiety uh, related to the efficacy and, and the safety of, of the virus. True. It seems that the, the message needs to be clearer to the people how effective they are, the efficacy. And I know, I mean, it, it would make no difference to me if you said there are four lipids, uh, uh, fats in, in, in the vaccine and uh, sodium chloride. I'm not, not quite sure what, what the difference would be. But if somebody wants to get those ingredients, uh, sh surely it should be something that is available for them to get. No, no, no. We, 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 I understand that. But my point, what I'm trying to make is that it shouldn't only be the health system that you have to create all this awareness. For example, when we have got lockdown restrictions, let's say alcohol, uh, curfews and all of those, there is an outcry, not only from the health and from everyone. What we are saying is about let each and every sector take a responsibility. Let each and every individual also take the responsibility. Of course, based on the research, we do know how to respond to the misinformed and uninformed. Those will respond differently. Uh, because it's part of the whole package of the uh, health, um, uh, I mean, seeking behavior. We understand that part. But what we're appealing is about those people who do know what are the consequences, but they are driving the agenda of the anti-health for their own reasons. And some of them will find that it has got to do because they want this type of a pill of a medication over the other one, mm. which is being driven by whether it's a pharmaceutical or whatever, all of those. But they are doing it at the expense of a health system. Because as I'm saying that, it's not only about the COVID, there are many other health problems that are out there. And now, as uh, MEC has indicated, the unemployment, we absorb all the social ills, the inequalities, where the other health sectors, they don't even make an effort to resolve them. But for us, we have to make sure that uh, we leave no one behind. Where there is no transport for the people to go to the health facility, we have to provide that transport from this minimal budget, which is, as you indicated earlier, is shrinking for the whole of the health sector. And Mr. Ramatuba, are men still a concern for you uh, when it comes to uh, the uptake? Men in rural uh, Limpopo, men in urban Limpopo, and uh, how are you countering uh, that particular aspect? Um, yes, we, we were facing a challenge um, earlier on with, uh, with men rejecting because, again, the very same uh, fake news that indicate that you will definitely lose your manhood and your capacity. And we again once more work with um, even our urologists and even design some of the communication. Right, we seem to have lost that connection there with MEC uh, Popi Ramatuba. Uh, we were asking.